and we wanted to use this opportunity to talk about um, racism and global health and, and what we can do um, to, to shift the narrative and to eliminate racism. So first, our disclaimer, the views in the session are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the views of USAID, PEPFAR, or the United States government. I'm honored to be part of this uh, presentation today with my wonderful colleagues, Dr. Joshua Vol, Nithya uh, Mani, um, Amelia Peltz, and myself. And a special thanks to Alex Perez, Didi Lofton, Mina Shirastava, Namasha Fernando, Amy Abera, and Emily Reitnauer. I'm not sure if the other presenters want to come on camera and say hello, or if you will, um, when it's your part of the presentation. Hey, Amelia, good to see you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, Joshua. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hi there. I'm Nithya. Hey, Nithya. Good to see you. So today's session objectives, first, we're going to name and understand the different manifestations of racism, understand ideas and behaviors in an anti-racist framework as a harm reduction strategy to mitigate impact within communities of color. We'll talk about the impact of races, uh, racist policies on global health and forward aid mechanisms. Again, we are too white and too old. And then we'll learn skills to affirm, counter, and transform or act when confronted, confronted with racism in the workplace and also in, in our personal lives. Um, so just uh, maybe a couple of housekeeping things. We would like to have some conversation um, at the end, but please make use of the chat um, throughout the, the presentation and we'll do our best to answer those uh, questions or um, have discussion uh, via chat. And then again, um, hopefully verbally, if people feel comfortable coming on camera and having conversations afterward. Um, so with that, we will jump in and thank you all again for attending and Joshua, over to you. Unmute, Joshua. I'm the old white man. We're too white and we're too old. Let's leave it on this slide for a moment because I'd like to have us start off by taking a moment of recognition of the struggles that the African American community in particular, but Native communities, Latino communities, Asian communities are undergoing right now. And in light of the conviction yesterday on the George Floyd case, I thought it would be a good idea for us to take a moment and just go silent and hold them in our hearts as we think about the, the effects that this terrorism is having on our, our brothers and sisters. So if everyone can take a deep breath and just hold the thought. Okay, thank you. One last thing we have to do before we can get, get this started is we have to acknowledge the that we all come from some, most of us anyway, I don't know you all, so I'll just say most of us all come from somewhere else. There are peoples who are from this land, who were in this land before anyone else arrived. We generally know them as the First Nations people and indigenous people, Native Americans. And your speakers are coming from before different distinct areas. And we wanted to recognize the native peoples of those areas. So from Amelia is coming from Toronto. And some of the folks that were originally in the Toronto area are the Chippewa and the Wendat. And Nithya is coming from Virginia. And some of the people who are in Virginia originally were the, the Powhatan and the Cherokee. I'm in Washington, DC. And some of our, our forebears are the Piscatawa and the Pamunkey. And Megan is out in Arizona, where among many nations, there are the Hopi, the Havasupai, and the Apache people. So we can just keep those people in mind. And I encourage everyone from wherever you are to find out who are the people who are there before you. 
and honor their experiences. Thank you. Okay, next slide. So welcome to this presentation and discussion. We hope that, that it spurs a lot of discussion in the, the, by the end of the, the, um, the presentation. We, we want to acknowledge that oppression is, has existed throughout history. It's not anything new. It's taken different forms and different shapes, but it has existed throughout history. And we're, and we're, in a, we're at a, a point where we get to make a difference and make a change in that and shift the culture away from, from oppression. Racism is one form of oppression that's also existed for centuries. It's important that we get to know our history and we get to understand race was a con is a construct that was put together 400 years ago to enslave people, to keep people in, in disempowered. It's important to keep in mind that it's an integral part of our society. It's not something that only exists in one small subset of, of the population. It was constructed primarily by European whites as a means of economic and political domination and control of natural resources. It's with us uh, still in our structures, our systems, our institutions, our policies, and our laws. This system is targeted at people of the global majority by white people to give white people the advantage and put people of the global majority at a, an unjust disadvantage. Generally speaking, most white people are pretty much unaware of, the, of how they're privileged and provided an advantage over the people of the global majority. We talk about being living in our bubbles and experiencing only what we know and having what we know drawing more experience of the same. It's important to also realize that all people are hurt by oppression. It's not just the targets, but it's all people. And we believe that white people, when, when white people become aware of the unjust system, they truly want to do something about it. And this is true for all white people, I'm, I'm sure. It's uh, how we get people to understand the unjust system is the challenge and making, helping folks awaken to the truth is the challenge. But once I th believe that once they awaken to the truth, they really want something to be different. It's, it's our belief, my belief that most people are good and doing the best that we can with what we know. So we've been taught these things. They've been handed down to us. They're within the bubble that we exist in. And it's all we know, it's all we see. But once we can unlearn these things and do something different, we're gonna choose that. Next slide, please. We're all born into this system, as I was saying, and it has existed since Christopher Columbus got lost and found himself among the Taino people in what's now called the Caribbean. Being born into the system means that we didn't create it. We are taught how to live in it by unwitting parents, grandparents, and communities. We have benefited from it. We need to be educated about it. We need to know our real his history or her history. We need to consciously work to transform institutions, policies, and laws. And we need to do our own internal work to find our blind spots. So I think this is a good, uh, this is a hopeful message. We aren't respond. We aren't, we didn't create it, but we are responsible for how it continues to play out. I think it's important to realize that we are being taught these on a daily basis as we're growing up, whether we're aware of it or not. And it's embedded in our history, so it's it's in our laws, it's in our policies, and it's in the constitution. And those things need to get changed because it's so built into our constitution and, and our laws and policies and our our bubble, our community, our family, we're blind to how it expresses itself. So that means we have to do the internal work to get uh, bring awareness to what where, we've, where we're blind and where we were not recognizing the things that we were taught and not recognizing the injustice, the injustice of those things. The only rules that there are for this session and I think they also apply to life in general, is to be listening, listening closely for what's being said, for what the other person's life experience is. Be respectful of that shared life experience. We don't have any cross talking because we want to hear from each other. So we don't actually speak when someone else is speaking. We keep an open mind and an open heart. This might be your truth right now, but truths change, believe it or not. And so we need to be open to that possibility. 
next slide. So what do we mean when we say racism? Next slide. There's a terrific book by Ibram K. X. Kendi called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And he spells it out pretty clearly for us. What is racism? It's when two or more races are perceived to not be standing on an equal footing. Racist idea is an idea that suggests that one racial group is inferior or superior to another racial group in any way. A racist policy is any measure that produces inequity between racial groups. A racist is one who is supporting racist policies through their actions or inaction or expressing a racist idea. And what is an anti-racist? Anti-racism is knowing that all racial groups are equals and none needs developing. That's a key thing, especially for those of us that are in the world of development. Nobody needs development. We're all, we're all developing on our own. Anti-racist ideas are any ideas that suggest the racial groups are, are equal in all their apparent differences. Anti-racist policies lead to racial equity and are substantiated by anti-racist ideas. An anti-racist is one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or expressing an anti-racist idea. So it's taking that stance to, to work towards, to act towards, to think towards, to move towards equality amongst all the different races. And it's, so it's action. Bumper stickers are not good enough. We need to get involved. We need to take a step. We need to take two steps. And every time we get knocked down, we need to take an, get up and take another step. This is not going to change without our action and our direct involvement. I highly recommend Abraham Kendi's book. If you haven't read it, go for it. Next. So this is a bit more of the structure. I'm recognizing the freaking T12. I'm sorry. Sarah, can you please put yourself on mute? Thank you. So there are four dimensions to racism. We have institutional racism, which is the policies and practices that reinforce racist standards in a workspace or an organization. Then you've got structural racism, which are the multiple institutions that collectively uphold the racist policies and practices. So education, along with the police, along with housing industry, together they form the structures. You've got internalized racism, which is a sub subtle and overt messages that reinforce negative beliefs and self-hatred in individuals. And you've got interpersonal racism, which is where people, most people think when they think about racism, racist acts and microaggressions carried out from one person to another. The majority of racists are not, don't, don't engage in interpersonal racism, except for maybe the microaggressions, which some folks have said we shouldn't even be calling microaggressions anymore. They're just plain old aggressions. But it's meant to be microaggression because it's, it's at the individual level rather than at the institutional or at the structural multiple institution level. Next slide. So it's important to keep in mind that implicit bias and structural racism are supportive of, you, of one another. It's really, really important to, to, to get to understand what the dominant narratives are about race that come from our families, from the media, from society at large, and couple that with the racist racialized structural arrangements and differential outcomes of, of race by race, all prime is, all, the, all these things come together to prime us to believe that people of color are inferior to white people. So they, they build off one another. The things we're taught and the way that the structures are set up. It's really crucial that we get to know our history is, what the policies are, what the practices are policies and practices that consolidate and protect, protect power, bestow unearned econ economic, social, cultural, political advantage on people called white and under and disadvantaged people of color or the people of the global majority. Um, the history is that money begets more money. So when my ancestors came to this country, this land, they came in very early and they took over a large portion of land. They need people to farm it. So they, they got slaves and they had the slaves farm that land. Then they reaped the benefit from it, uh, the financial benefit from it. They passed that on down to the next generation who continued to build more money off of the money that they've got and pass on down one after the other after the other so that the money stayed within the family. And it gives a 
cultural and social advantages that other people don't have. Inequity, inequitable outcomes and racial disparities are result from policies and decisions around health, housing, employment, education, and life expectancy. So if you think about it, one of the, one of the worst, one of the most powerful, let me say it that way, cases of discrimination took, takes place in the housing industry where cities and regions of, of real estate are, are redlined and people are prevented from living in certain areas or forced into living in other areas. And then you force people to live in a low poverty area, they uh, end up not having access to proper health care, proper nutrition, good educational systems. The education system is built off of, is funded by the local community. If local community is already disadvantaged economically, then they're not going to be able to put the money into the schools to get the resources that they need. You've heard of um, food deserts. There are very few white neighborhoods that are food deserts, but there are a lot of black neighborhoods that are food deserts. So it sort of perpetuates itself and it results in inequitable outcomes. Next slide. This is just another way of looking at pulling on all the different structures, keeping in mind that structural racism is based on institutional racism, which is within the hiring and promoting of a work environment, within the wealth dispersion and institution of our banks and loaning money out for businesses and jobs um, and housing, the education system, the justice system is one of the major problems we've got happening right now because of the way that, that the system is structured and set up to be biased against people of the global majority, both men and female. So each, each one of these is, is a problem in and of itself, but you bring them all together and you've got a structure that's full of racism and full of challenges and, and unequal access and unequal outcomes. Next slide. So what about global health? Just to, to quote, give a, a quick quote. The neocolonialist approach to public health assumes that Less economically developed nations have health problems that only white men from economically advanced, powerful nations know how to solve. So that's sort of the perception. The global health system itself actually is rooted in colonialism. So we can call it neocolonialism, but it's really based, it's got its history in colonialism where the outsider has to come in to help the, the in-country, host country nationals to, to develop, as we said, as I said earlier. Next slide. But from a neo-colonialist perspective, it's, it's the foreign economic domination, as well as military and political intervention of states that were already, that already achieved independence from the colonial rule. So it's, in, in one sense, it's, it's, a, it's a new form of colonialism, but in another sense, it's just a, it's the same energy. It's the same, it's just an extension of the mindset that we can come into this land and take it over and do what we want to do because these people are inferior to us. It's neocolonialism. Next slide. Amelia, is this going over to you now? Yes, it is. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Joshua. So as Joshua illustrated, the global health architecture globally is fundamentally rooted in colonial ideologies and practices. And while important shifts have been taking place, and it's important to, to acknowledge those, the long-term effects continue to play out in our day-to-day -day structures and practices. Next slide, please. So this is some data from the Equal Employment Opportunity Program Status Report of 2019. And it showed that 70% of the direct hire staff within the Bureau for Global Health at USAID are white. Of that 70%, half are women. 
Now, it should be noted that this data only reflects direct hire staff and doesn't include non-direct hire staff within the Bureau, which does make up a significant uh, population of the global health workforce. Nevertheless, the data is quite striking. Next slide, please. So now let's just take a closer look at this data, which in this graph has been disaggregated by sex, race, and federal grade level. So as we can see, white males and white females are overrepresented at the higher grade levels, while Black or African American males and females are overrepresented at the lower grade levels. So the disparities here are quite stark. Next slide, please. So this is another way to, to look at some of this data, this time by the percentage of staff that make up each of those federal grade levels. Again, we see here that the higher the grade level, the more it is comprised by white females and males with black or African-American females and males and Latino females overrepresented in some of those lower federal grade levels. Next slide, please. So let's, great, thanks. Let's focus now on the age of the federal workforce. Now note that this is the entire US federal workforce. So we're looking at data beyond the Global Health Bureau and beyond just USAID. According to the most recent federal workforce data from the Office of Personnel Management, as of June of 2018, 14% of the federal workforce is over 60, while just 7.8% is under 30. And this is out of an approximate population of about 2 million employees. 20 years ago, the over 60 population represented 5.7% of the workforce, while 7.5% of the workforce was under 30. Next slide, please. So in this graph, we can see a remarkable gap in the age demographics of the public versus the private sector. The federal workforce is old and getting older. And as we saw in the earlier slides, at least for the Global Health Bureau, predominantly white. So how do these demographic factors play out in our work? So for the next part of the story, I'll turn the presentation over to my colleague, Nithya Manny, who will walk us through that. Nithya, over to you. Great, thanks, Amelia. Um, so I'm gonna cover um, some of the more um, specific ways that racism can manifest in global health, um, reflecting back on some of the neocolonial roots that um, Joshua referred to earlier on in the, in the session. Next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about voluntourism. Um, voluntourism is a form of tourism where travelers participate in voluntary work, typically through a charity or a foreign aid organization. In many cases, volunteerism is more beneficial to the tourists than it is to the communities that they attempt to serve. And so why is this? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the reasons um, why this um, is the case. So often local resources are drained. Communities receiving volunteers want to be great hosts. So they pour their own resources into ensuring food and accommodations are sufficient, but often those resources could be better used to improve their own lives. While volunteers may consider themselves a helpful resource of manpower during the work, they're actually also just another individual to have to feed and take care of. Volunteers can often be inexperienced. One of the biggest arguments against volunteerism is a lack of related experience volunteers have for the work they're expected to do in the field. Take, for example, a volunteer who's helping to build houses. If this person doesn't have the right skill set, their work may be of poor quality, perhaps even unstable. In the end, this, end up, this ends up costing the community more time, more money and energy than the volunteer has expended. Sometimes there's not enough time. Volunteer vacations are usually short. They can last between a few days to a couple weeks. And since most of the time is spent working, volunteers often miss out on opportunities to gain a deeper understanding of the culture of the country that they're visiting. The local economy can be disrupted. Volunteers can show up to work, but they're often uh, putting local laborers out of work or in the case of housing volunteers, um, other local um, carpenters or construction workers um, that could be benefiting from those uh, jobs. And then lastly, um, sometimes just poor supervision. Local communities aren't, are prone to exploitation when volunteerism 
has inadequate supervision, um, and there may not be any any direct um, harm that they're meaning to create, but it often um, can make vulnerable people even more um, vulnerable at certain standards. Next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about the white savior industrial complex. Um, white supremacy and racism often can also manifest through the white savior complex. Um, the term white savior has different meanings in different contexts, but in relation to global health, it typically refers to the practice of global health in which students, researchers, and volunteers from high resource countries work in lower and middle income countries, usually um, where we have black and brown beneficiaries. Many who join these global health experiences are often can be unqualified to perform and work safely in the vulnerable communities, but do so anyway, and often through short trips that are usually affiliated with schools, religious bodies, or volunteer groups. There are, however, many examples where the white savior complex is, is not as egregious and doesn't necessarily result in direct harm. And this can be where individuals are appropriately trained in their home institutions and often work, work abroad, perhaps without the same level of accountability, but are often able to, to do an impact some change. The white saber complex in global health international development is well known and there are many websites dedicated to not only identifying it, acknowledging it, but also to some extent mocking it. I'm going to talk a little bit about those in the next coming slides. Next slide. So to bring a little bit of a levity to this, um, we wanted to highlight one site that acknowledges and mocks in a very clever way the white savior complex in global health, specifically in the form of untrained and inexperienced people working in vulnerable communities and on short-term trips. So this is Barbie Savior, as she can be found on Instagram. Um, you can see the link here in the orange box. She loves to have a lot of followers. So if you're interested, you can look her up and start following her. But here is a photo of Barbie Savior with a little girl in a local clinic. And there's a, there's a quote in there that I just wanted to read, which is that today I sacrificed my daily beautiful beauty regimen using Rodent and Heels product line to visit the local hospital to love on and care for my sweet African angels. It provided me the perfect opportunity to snap some selfies with the less fortunate, even with the poor lighting. So just an example um, that exemplifies one way that this manifests in global health um, and one that we may have, many of us may have seen. Next slide. Another one um, sort of trending on um, the concept around um, photos is humanitarians of Tinder. This is actually a real site um, that acknowledges that racism acknowledges racism and mocks the white savior complex within international work, whereby Westerners, usually young people, go on short-term health or development trips and take photos of themselves with black or brown people, usually children in countries they're working, and then post those photos on Tinder to attract prospective partners. This is something that's really infuriating to many black and brown people who are off to can be used as props to show something interesting or cool to potential partners. Next slide. So here's a quote here from Richard Horton, the editor in chief of The Lancet. Um, and I just want to note here that it's important to understand that the context within which foreign aid, international volunteering, and other international mechanisms function is to understand how they may propagate or reinforce power dynamics built on racism and impression, similar to what Joshua mentioned earlier on in the session. In many cases, we focus on diversity, equity and inclusion, mentorship and funding strategies, which are all important. What we don't talk about enough is how the structures and operations of our organizations are part of a white supremacist culture. We don't talk about how white people and those who center whiteness support policies and programs that perpetuate neocolonialism. And I say this even as a woman of color working in an organization with, with staff who speak multiple languages and come from different backgrounds. White supremacist culture is so powerful and we are rewarded in so many ways for conforming to it that we are sometimes blind to its influence. Next slide. So I wanna um, leave you all in this section with a couple of questions. Um, our language and approaches are remnants of this ideological framework. And it's important that we reflect on some of these questions here as we think about the work that we carry out. 
why do we think we think about poor people in distant lands as beneficiaries or targets of our work? What makes their lives a deliverable outcome? Do our degrees, money, and good intentions give us the right to do this? And do we still not profit on the exploitation of communities of color and other vulnerable groups? And perhaps we can talk more about this during the discussion as well. I'll turn it back over to Megan now. Thanks, Nithya. So if you're like me and you're a novice to anti-racism and new to it, or whether you consider yourself an, an expert, um, hopefully the previous conversations and previous presentations maybe made you a little uncomfortable and made you feel a little um, gut-wrenching or made your stomach churn a little bit, maybe took your breath away for a minute. Um, and so I think one of the things that we often think about is, is what can I do about it? Sure, I can, I can read um, and I can, I can have discussions about it, but I want to act. Um, and that's something that um, this next section I'd like to share with you again as a novice coming into this space, um, how, how I feel like Megan, if you can hear us, um, it seems that your uh, sound and video has frozen. Sorry, everyone, um, just stand by for a minute. We're trying to resolve some technical difficulties and we'll be with you momentarily. So maybe while we're um, sorting out the technical difficulties, um, we can take a little bit of time to have a discussion or answer any questions um, that have come up to date. I think I see one um, in the chat um, that is, it would be interesting to see the differences in data for institutional contractors versus direct hires, given some of the contracting mechanisms in global health are specifically designed to help diversify the USA workforce, yet inequities exist between ISC and direct hire positions, and barriers exist to move long serving ISCs into direct hire positions. Yeah, that's a really good point, Sydney. And um, actually we are, there are a number of efforts underway to try to get more um, comprehensive data on, um, staff across specifically the Global Health Bureau um, in terms of contracting mechanisms and um, how we can um, move institutional contractors into other positions. But thank you for that comment. 
Megan, looks like maybe you're back with us. I hope so. Apologies. I guess it wouldn't be a true um, a true COVID event if we didn't have a little bit of technical difficulty. So apologies about that. Um, and thanks, Nithya, for addressing that comment. Um, I know that you've been working a lot with the subgroup um, on that area, so appreciate it. Okay, continuing on, sorry about that again, um, ACT. So first we're going to affirm and connect with our audience, and then we're going to create a sense of unity or shared faith, fate. And the important thing here is to come from speaking from your heart um, and always putting your heart first um, and using racially explicit language and hi highlighting that commonality. So an example here is, um, let's say we have a colleague who says, I just don't understand what all of this talk is about healthcare and the COVID vaccine and the disparities among communities of color. Everybody should get the COVID vaccine. Everybody should have, should have healthcare. I don't understand why we keep talking about communities of color. So that would be your first um, kind of trigger hopefully of you to say, I think I should say something about that. And how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna act. First, I'm going to affirm and reply, we all deserve accessible, high quality healthcare. So again, you're creating that sense of agreement and that sense of, of being on the same page with the person that you're discussing with. And then the next step is to see and act to counter. So you're gonna highlight the issue, use some brief historical context, focus on institutional and structural factors, and explain how these factors impact communities and individuals today. Important to remember here to name race directly, be explicit about the disproportionate impact of communities uh, that communities of color face, highlight, um, the contract between shared values and reality and name institutional opportunities and actions. So the example and the reply of this would be to, while yes, everyone deserves this healthcare, we need to remember that communities across the world lack access to basic healthcare, particularly people of color living in low and middle income countries due to longstanding power hierarchies that create economic inequity and unequal distribution of resources. So then the last step to act is to transform. And so hopefully this is your opportunity to propose a solution that emphasizes concrete steps or opportunities or strategies. Um, you can use this to, to create a common moral ground between you and the individual or the, the group you're discussing with, and then um, promote commitment and promote that, that change of mind. Um, again, it's important to start and end with heart, highlighting the shared good and reinforcing that emotional connection. And then again, promoting a shared vision of a more equitable world. So the example reply here on transform would be to add health disparities tied to, ration, to racism and structural oppression are reinforced by existing power dynamics, which harm all of us. However, we all have opportunities to bridge, bridge the equity gap and promote equity throughout policy change, education, international collaboration, and transitional justice. Now, if you're like me, I don't actually speak like that on a day-to-day -day basis. So you're going to want to you know, make sure that maybe you practice this um, with, with your close friends and um, and um, colleagues. Um, but again, this is something that, that if you can use when you, again, you hear those instances or maybe you observe a microaggression in the workplace um, and you apply the ACT acronym, um, you can really start to make the difference and change, again, the conversation um, toward more uh, of equitable and appropriate and anti-racist conversations. Another um, idea, another um, framework that we wanted to share with you was the um, American uh, Association of American Medical Colleges um, and their pillars for addressing and eliminating race, racism. So they have four steps here. The first focusing on the individual self-reflection and systemic racism. So doing reading um, and reflecting and, and working um, you know, on, on what Joshua was, was mentioning before, finding kind of your, your blind spots. Two, establishing diversity, equity, and inclusion advisors. And so I highly encourage all of you in your work workspaces to to think about um, opportunities to, to really establish uh, spaces to talk about um, adversity, uh, diversity and equity. Um, the third step here is collaborating with research and medical institutions to advance anti-racism efforts. And then the fourth is advocacy and community engagement to advance anti-racism efforts. And then the third step that I, I think all of us here, if we're in the, the field of global health or are interested in, in joining the, the field of global health is really to be mindful and act on how we can decolonize global health. Um, we must be aware of our own privilege, values, and implicit biases when interacting with our country partners and peers. So we have some reflective questions here to ask yourself, how much space do I take up in conversations with non-white individuals? Am I centering the voice of country and community leaders as the experts in my work? Is our approach building from the bottom up? Are we prioritizing transitional justice? 
Am I working to deconstruct my own internalized idea of what aid and support means in the international context? So again, going back to Nithya's um, excellent description and, and discussion about white saviorism. So with those, I think um, hopefully that gives you um, some other, some new ideas or new things to think about and how you can act and, and um, be an active um, participant in anti-racism work across what you're doing and, and across the globe. Um, I've, we've linked in here a non-exhaustive list. There, there's tons and tons of resources. Um, and we just saw a statistic recently that anti-racism resources and materials have actually, uh, sales of, have, have increased by 600% in the last few months. Um, so there's there's lots of resources out there. We, we created this list of articles and some reading ideas um, for those who are interested. Um, and um, hopefully it's accessible when we set the slides out for everybody. Um, but we just wanna um, thank you all again for your time um, and hope that we can have a discussion in the next 15 minutes or so in the last um, part of that, this uh, conversation on any thoughts or reflections or reactions um, to what we talked about um, with, with you know, keeping in mind that um, racism stops, stops with you and that even though it can seem like we're powerless um, as an individual, um, that we do have ability and, um, and skills and uh, qualities that we can um, offer to, again, change that narrative and commit to anti-racism in your life and in your personal life and in your workforce. So with that, I will pause and I'm not sure if there's chat that's going on um, or any other um, uh, folks who are participants on the line who'd like to come um, on camera or on um, video and ask any questions. So Megan, I see that we've started to get some questions there in the chat box. Um, one is about what internal policy changes are already underway to decolonize USAID's approach and address structural racism as shared here at USAID. Um, there was also a similar question um, a little bit further down that says, what is USAID doing uh, to address structural racism? So I thought maybe what we could do is just speak a little bit about what we are doing in the Office of HIV AIDS. Um, uh, just to give you a couple of examples of, of how we are trying to um, embody and, and live out this work. So about a year ago, um, after the murder of George Floyd, within the Office of HIV AIDS, um, many staff came together with a collective sense of urgency of wanting to address issues around structural racism, both in the work that we do, the programs and services that we, uh, that we support, as well as within the, the structures within our own office. And so we created an office-wide anti-racism task force, and this is comprised of staff from across our office. We're, I think a little bit over 60 individuals right now who participate in that. We also have a smaller uh, secretariat that meets on a weekly basis to help keep a lot of the, the energy and the momentum around some of the different activities moving forward. Um, we have a couple of different specific um, working groups that are focused in, on, on particular areas. Um, that includes working on human resources and hiring practices, looking at how we can better uh, uh, recruit and retain um, a diverse workforce and not just a diverse workforce, but one that is also committed to anti-racist uh, practices and, and principles. We also have several groups that are focused a lot on um, dialogue and learning, understanding the roots of colonialism and racism, how it affects us as an individual, how it affects us as a society, how it plays out in our um, social and economic policies, and in particular, our work within global health. And so those are also ongoing. In addition to that, we also um, hired um, an external consultant, a, racial, a workforce racial equity consultant, who's helping to not only provide us with um, technical expertise, but also really helping us to support the work and the changes that we are hoping to see um, within our office. Um, and in addition to that, we are going to be having <clears throat> another award that's going to be focused on looking at um, 
the, a sort of a systematic assessment of our current policies and practices and provide longer term guidance on the kinds of changes and the kinds of things that, that we need to do. We also have a series of affinity groups, both within the Office of HIV AIDS, as well as um, across USAID overall. And we're also trying to liaise and work with them closely to, um, to reinforce and to support those efforts as well. Um, Nithya, Joshua, Megan, anything else you would want to add to that? I think just just one thing, Amelia, thank you for that for that great summary. I think one thing that's just important to remember um, if maybe you're listening in and thinking about how could I do something like that in my workplace um, are, like Amelia said, this was a very organic conversation that just um, started. I think from just a couple of us kind of connecting and saying, oh, I've had a conversation with so-and-so, I've had a conversation with so-and-so, and we just kind of decided to come together as a group and, and talk about it. Um, and I think it was, you know, at first just a place for us to feel safe, to be able to talk about um, the horrific more murder of George Floyd. And then again, organically evolved into something that I think we're all really proud of and are excited to see um, how it can really um, move move the dial and address some of the structural racism um, th throughout our office, throughout the, the Bureau and in global health. And so, um, you know, just encourage you to to take that risk. Um, and um, we're, we're happy to, um, you know, be a resource for you and and um, and support that. But it was definitely an organic conversation that that um, we encourage others to take as well. Nithya, did you want to say something before I jump in? Um, sure. I was you no. Know, I was just going to add that I think um, you know we're doing a lot in our office, but I know we have other colleagues here from other offices in global health as well, and there's a lot of efforts being made across the Bureau, um, including like a coordination structure that's been put together um, across the Bureau and each office is um, undergoing similar um, discussion groups. And I think just to not underestimate the importance of having those discussions and holding those spaces, I think, you know, often in our work, we are so task oriented and so focused on um, benchmarks and achieving um, targets and results. Um, but I think it was really important for us to really make the time and space to have those conversations. Um, and that really sort of set up a um, foundation for us to now be able to take on um, a more rigorous kind of racial equity audit um, for the office. And let me just add, cause you all have done such a good job of explaining all this. Let me just add that one of the key factors in this being able to move forward and thrive is that senior management's been behind it. They've supported it they've, from, from just letting staff have uh, time away from the job to come to a listening group or an education experience to bring or find the resources to hire the consultants and the, uh, the consulting agency is gonna do the audit. So it really does require leadership getting behind the, the movement. So Melissa, I think we're, we'll be sending out the slides afterwards that have the link um, right in it. So we'll be sending out all of that after the presentation. Any other thoughts or questions or reflections that anyone wants to share? I see David's question about um, whether we need email addresses to receive the slides. I don't know, Priscilla, if you're able to help answer that. Yes, sure. Well, I think you send a private message. If you can send me a private message, I'll sort that out.
Thank you. Sure, I, would you like, I maybe can bring that slide back up. Oh, sorry. I thought it was she was actually was saying that she wanted to to uh, reflect on it. She was asking for the presenters to reflect on them. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I, I'm, I will just I'll be really honest and maybe a little vulnerable here um, that I was reading an article recently and um, definitely benefited in my career from volunteerism. Um, when I first started off in global health, I was really adamant um, about getting those experiences and um, and, you know, then reading back and reflecting on it. It was um, the realization that that I was perpetuating um, you know, white saviorism. And um, so I think that that's been something for me personally that has been a really um, um, insightful uh, kind of my background and my personal history to um, form and shape the way that I um, try to come to work every day and in the way that I interact with my colleagues and the way that I that I do come to work. Um, and I try to be really cognizant about using the terms beneficiary, um, but about using, um, you know, even I just was uh, the other day was had to correct something that was written down with um, with um, HIV positive people when we're now saying people living with HIV. Um, you know, so, so I think there are small things that can be done that can be changed um, and to um, to remember again at, at the core of what we're doing is about is about people and not about, um, you know, programs and targets and money and, um, you know, making it look good on paper um, and in data points. I can add to um, Megan's reflections, and I, I see there was also um, a comment here about um, what we'd like to see in the way USA frames, funds, and drives global health priorities internationally. I think speaking from kind of the PEPFAR perspective, because we, we all work on um, HIV, and you know, I think there has been a large focus on targets and results, and sometimes I think um, the beneficiary or clients that we serve are sometimes lost in the way we discuss, but certainly that is a focus that's very much at the heart of everything that PEPFAR does and I think is really being brought back into the discussion, even in terms of how we talk about um, services and client-centered services, especially for the more marginalized and vulnerable populations. I think one specific thing that um, we're seeing, seeing more of, and I think would be good to see in USA more broadly is the inclusion of beneficiaries in programming, um, programming design and implementation. And I think um, there is a much wider involvement of civil society organizations and other um, organizations in the way we plan and program. And I think really ensuring that that type of inclusive approach um, from start to finish is embedded and institutionalized in all of our programming is something that's really important. Um, hopefully we can make happen more consistently. I think a lot of it has to do with respect of the, the folks who are living the experience in country, the Ministry of Health and the hospital-based doctors and nurses, the, the citizenry, they know what their issues are, they know what their concerns are. And rather than coming in with a preset agenda, we need to come in with some flexibility and say, we're here to help you help yourselves and let, let the community decide what are the, the main issues that they need the support with and let them lead the way instead of this more top-down preset agenda approach that we've used. I'm a researcher and when I go in to do some research, the first thing that I do is have conversations with my counterparts at the universities to find out if they find it valuable, if they wanna get involved, if they, because I still coming from that place where I've got an agenda because I've been paid to do a certain kind of assessment. 
but I can at least involve the folks and respect their knowledge, respect their history, respect their tradition, and engage them in, in a way that says they're the actual expert. I'm just going to bring in some methods approaches and some analysis approaches, but they're the experts on the topic. So what do they need to know to help themselves, to move themselves forward? So I think it has a lot to do with that kind of engagement, that kind of respect. It is a process, but we have to start talking about it more and more. Thanks, David. I think that that's a really um, important, I think COVID has really shed light on, on this area much more. Um, and I think it has just um, exacerbated the, the inequities and the, the, the transparency, frankly, into, into the inequity, inequities that exist. Um, and I think is, again, now is, now is the time, I know that the, um, they said that in the opening plenary, but now is the time to really um, move, move and, and use this, this kind of jolt as an opportunity to, to, change, to change how we're doing business um, and to, to ensure that we're um, working in global health in a way um, that is not only not racist, but is also anti-racist. So um, thanks for sharing the article. So I know we only have we only have two more minutes, and I know others are will be off um, to the next session. So any presenters, any other last minute thoughts that you'd like to share, um, or any other participants? Um, I, feel I, free. I, I know we're in the last couple of minutes, but I really want to make sure we address. I apologize, Aishwarya, if I say your name wrong, but you made a comment here that's very important about the mix, the makeup of this uh, this panel. It's a it's um, a difficult issue because absolutely we need to have the voices and the, the leadership of people of the global majority in what we're doing. But we don't wanna leave the, everything over to the people of the global majority to do and have the white people just sit back and just go, okay, we're, we're done with our job. We put leaders out there so we can just follow them now. We're in, we're in this together. Could we be more mixed? We could be more mixed. We could have um, a more of a diverse panel Absolutely, but it doesn't. I don't want to, 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 that to detract from the message that we're trying to get across. We're in this together. We're hand in hand. We're shoulder to shoulder, standing there, trying to say we need to make some changes, and these are the changes that we think we need to make and a way forward. So I thank you for your comment, and I appreciate it very much. I also see. Um a comment here about the, the demographic split of the workforce um, and further analysis on the makeup of the roles. So this is something that we're actually um, trying to do right now with an external organization. Um, and so we are very much looking at kind of the hiring mechanism, the grade, as well as the particular role or function that the individual plays and in looking at that across um, um, race and ethnicity as well. Well, we're at we're at time now, so I, I want to again be respectful of everybody's time to be able to participate in the following sessions that come after um, of after hours. But um, just want to really appreciate everyone. Thank you all to the presenters during this busy time um, in PEPFAR for taking the time to to present um, along alongside of me. Um, and again, thank you to our participants um, for joining today. And um, hope that hope that you learn something and can take something from here um, um, out into your personalized and into your workforce.